What you're about to see is a true story of the most incredible military operation on British soil in modern times. For the first time, the SAS soldiers who took part are going to tell what happened. The busting of the embassy siege in 1980 was the SAS calling card to the world. It said acts of terrorism would no longer be tolerated on British soil. That force would be met with force. This film goes beyond the newsreels and examines those events through the eyes of the men who took part. Not the police, not the politicians, us. It shows for the first time what actually happened when we went in. All the soldiers you meet in here are SES, the men who did it. This is the way it was. On Monday the 30th of April 1980, six Arab terrorists took over the Iranian embassy in London and held 26 people hostage. The six-day siege that followed developed into one of the most menacing situations the government had faced. It ended in an action that would live forever in regimental history. We went in to do the impossible because we knew we could, and it was all down to training. All our close quarter battle drills are carried out in an area called the Killing House. Here we use live ammunition in rooms with 360 degrees arcs of fire. We are the only ones who do this. Dangerous and realistic. The main quality of siege busting room combat is speed, aggression and surprise. Once the roller ball starts moving, nothing can stop it. You've got to maintain the momentum. You need guys with immense physical courage, strength, stamina. All the key points are joining the SAS. The SAS is actually recognised as the best counter-terrorist team in the world. One, because of the amount of training they do. And the uh, motto that we use is, train hard, fight easy. Okay, guys, gather in. Safety catch is on. Anywhere where a group of terrorists take over a position and fortify it, the SES role is to bust the place wide open and neutralise the threat. Okay, that was a good effort there. A good effort. Good, good, good momentum. Good movement down the the actual passageway. Just a bit of a problem in this room here. We had a, a stoppage. Okay, let's get inside here. Sort the situation out and let's get on with the work. We have a technique where we can completely black out the killing house. We then do a PNG shoot, PNG being passive night goggles, and it brings up the interior of the building okay. just like daylight. Don't forget, if you're in training, guys, stoppage, cry out stoppage, down in one knee, clear the stoppage, and carry on with the exercise. If you're doing it operationally and you're doing multi-room uh, multi clearance, Stoppage! Sling your weapon to one side, bring out your backup or secondary weapon, carry on fire. Do you understand that? Yep. Yep. Dusty, why don't you do a demonstration here on, on the actual stoppage rules? Okay, he's gone his fire and all right. Done stops. Stop it! Okay, can you see that? It's as simple as that. Carry on fire and get, keep the momentum going. Don't forget, I want to see you go through these premises like shit through a goose. Do you understand that? Yeah. Well, yep. is, there, is there any problems? No, no, no. Okay, let's go back and try it again. Okay. All soldiers that do the SP team in Hereford are seasoned soldiers. They've been in combat and they know what it's like to be at the sharp end, have incoming rounds zipping over their heads. So they're not worried about a bit of gunfire. You can train a person to perfection, but when there's rounds coming down and uh, rounds zipping over your head, who knows how you're going to react? 
until that day comes. We had an interesting little exercise to initiate the young, inexperienced troop officer. Don't fucking move. We would place two figure 11 targets three foot apart. And in between these two targets, we would place the young troop officer. The place would then, or the range would then be totally blackened out. And we had two of our best shots burst in. The torches would come on and both figure 11 targets on either side of the troop officer would be well drilled, at least one magazine apiece into each target. And don't forget, the guy in the middle was live, a live body. And this we call the battle inoculation test. We had a few fidgets, but no one ever actually moved into the line of fire. This is what discipline and training does for you. On the morning of uh, April the 30th, 1980, about halfway through the morning, the bleepers, which is attached to your belt, suddenly all went off. And when I looked down at mine, it had the three nines, which means that this was going to be the real thing, that a terrorist incident had taken place somewhere, and it wasn't an exercise. Radio has forced a policeman on duty outside the Iranian embassy in London to go inside the building. He's now said to be being held at gunpoint. Details of this morning's serious incident at the Iranian embassy in London are still coming in. Scotland Yard say that a policeman on duty outside the building has been forced inside by a man armed with a rifle. Men from the Yard's embassy protection squad have now surrounded the embassy, which is located in the fashionable Kensington area of the city. Armed police According surrounded to the one Iranian embassy in London after a man with a gun inside. had forced a police officer police outside to go in the building with him. The two men are still inside and shots are said to have been heard from the embassy. We'll Gerald Butt has been piecing together in. the details so far. It was at about half past 11 this morning that a man armed with a rifle turned up at the embassy in Prince's Gate near Kensington Gardens. What happened then still isn't absolutely clear, but it seems the police constable was forced at gunpoint to go inside. A short time later, several shots were heard from inside, but it's not known if anyone has been hurt. Scotland Yard said a short time ago they believe that the policeman is being held by two gunmen. Scotland Yard aren't saying how the alarm was raised, although it's understood that there's a button that can be pressed at the reception desk in the entrance hall at the embassy, which sets off an alarm at the yard. Armed police wearing bulletproof vests have surrounded the embassy building and ambulances are on hand. Now for a look at the day in detail, Brian Walker takes up the story. Very soon after the raiders burst into the Iranian embassy, an Arab-speaking police interpreter made the first contact with them by shouting through the open windows to begin the delicate task of trying to get the 20 hostages released and find out what precisely the raiders wanted. Mr. Zarin, your wife is held in the embassy well, when was the first you heard that she'd been held? It was an hour, half an hour ago when I had my lunch with friends. Somebody told me the Iranian embassy was sieged. That's why I came here to learn about it and see what's going on. What did your wife do in the embassy? She's the switch operator and the secretary. What have the police told you? Um, Nothing much, just they told me that they're negotiating with the people over there. And I don't know anything then. Have they told you anything about the condition of the hostages? No, just I heard one woman was injured and I don't know his, her name and that's why I'm worried so much now. Could be my wife. Six hours later came confirmation of the raiders' demands from a BBC news producer, Chris Kramer, who was one of two BBC hostages inside. In his telex message, Kramer said, they are demanding the release of 91 Arabs held in prison in South Iran. If the demands are not met, they will blow up the hostages and themselves. Everything stopped in the killing house. We all looked around in disbelief. The guy who was doing 3IC of the team came into the killing house. And he said, hey, get the guys down. There's a siege underway. This was it, the real thing. It was going to happen. Pack your gears, boys. We're going to war. It's not an exercise. It's actually a real. It looks like we'll be going on a, a real job. Of course, everybody goes, bollocks. You know, you think it's all wind up. But as it turned out, it was for real. Uh, we all got called into the briefing room. 
and uh, the Colonel turned up and a few others and explained what was happening down here in London. And uh, so everybody said, sort of, oh, yippee, you know, this is going to be real. 36 of us loaded up in Hereford and drove through the night. Because at this stage the police had contained the siege, we didn't know if we'd be using an aggressive role or not. It all depended on what the terrorists did next. Police are settling in tonight for a long wait around the embassy in Kensington. The embassy is in Prince's Gate, just off Kensington Road, and an area a quarter of a mile square, almost from the Albert Hall to Ennismore Gardens, has been sealed off. The Metropolitan Police. The two squadrons feeling on the day kind of was one of, after all the training we've been put through, um, it was nice to be given the chance to go and actually carry out an operation because hours and hours of shooting, hours and hours of exercise um, are never ever going to give you the, the feeling that when you do an operation and carry one out success, successfully, um, they, they can never give you that achievement. Busloads of reinforcements, many of them armed and wearing flak jackets, have been arriving through the day. But police aren't saying how many men they've got deployed in the area. They've taken over vantage points in and on the buildings surrounding the embassy. We arrived at Regent Park Barracks, West London, about 11.30pm that night. This was going to be the holding area for the next couple of days until they made a decision to move us up to number 14, Princess's Gate, which was actually next door to the, the terrorist stronghold. This was a real-life operation, so we were totally kitted out. We had extra ammunition, we had extra stun grenades. Myself, I had my, my body armour, Bristol body armour, with the high-velocity plate, the Hecklecock MP5. I had my Browning, the lightweight Northern Ireland boots. They're good for running in and kicking doors down. My S6 respirator, and also to be worn under the body armour, we had MBC suits, which is a good gas hood to give you protection against the gas that we were going to pump into the rooms at the front. We'll use anything that will give us that little bit extra, that little bit to give us the upper hand. And if you're properly kitted out, you're unstoppable. You do feel weighted down, but I can assure you, when you're in a live operation and your body's charged with adrenaline, it's like you're running around in a T-shirt. Throughout the night, scores of police, some of them armed, have been keeping vigil outside the Iranian embassy in London. But the police have kept up a dialogue with the gunmen for much of the time, talking to them through the front window and door and by telephone. My colleague David, who came to talk to you last night, will be walking down and will be with you, I suppose, in about one minute's time. I'll stay on the telephone, if I may, just to see if, if there are any queries arise at the time. Just to see if any queries arise or if you have any problems. Okay. Right. Thank you. How's things? You okay? Thank you very much. Good. Uh, Salam is awaiting... Uh, the frustration of waiting is the worst uh, part of a soldier's life. Zero, You've got to play a democratic game, a game of diplomacy. It's part of the society we live in. We've got to play that game. Once the leash is pulled, the shutters go up, you can get to grip with the enemy. You know you can kill them. Hello. I want to thank you for the cigarettes. Salim. Salim, that, that's my pleasure. We sent um, 200 tipped and 200 plain. We, we didn't know what else to do. Was that all right? Thank you very much. OK. Thank Thanks. Bye. Good night. Okay. Thank you very much, David. Some 80 Iranian students gathered behind police barriers, but well within earshot of the embassy, have been demonstrating their support for those being held inside. The demonstrations, potentially a dangerous situation, that could be used to inflame the volatile situation within the siege itself, within number 16. The terrorists could have reacted in an unpositive way. They could have even started firing out the windows. Who knows? been other chants too. Death to Carter. We are Allah's soldiers. We are Khomeini's soldiers. And so on. 
many of the students are wearing white tunics made from sheets and bearing slogans like, we will give our last drop of blood for the Ayatollah in both English and Arabic. Ever present outside the embassy, which has shown no lights all night, wait two ambulances and there's a doctor close by. The negotiators, the marksmen and the watchers are in place. So now the police have settled into the routine that became familiar at Balcombe Street and at the Spaghetti House sieges. A routine which proved totally effective in both cases. As the siege pro progressed, there were certain technical surveillance uh, pieces of equipment used. Some of them used in the walls, uh, possibly in the ceilings, to monitor or try to monitor and get us any information that would prove vital to the success of this operation. but the other, the yeah. other Iranian hostages. There has been a phone call. What, what, um, what was the message? Uh, the message, I think, he said we will not yield to the demands of the, host, uh, the, the group. Uh, what is your reaction to that message? Uh, I think he will regret for this statement. Can you go into details? What do you mean he will regret it? I mean, uh, after the deadline, every, we will kill everybody here, all the hostages. Over 24 hours have elapsed since this incident started. The gunmen inside the Iranian embassy must know that it is not within our power to meet all of their demands. Whatever our views on the rights and wrongs of their cause it may be. I appeal to them to remain calm. Hasty action may cause even more suffering to their own people in Iran. I feel deep sympathy for all the hostages in this time of stress. All my officers engaged in this incident are concerned to do what we always try to do, resolve the situation without loss of life and uphold the law. 
we must show patience and perseverance. On the following evening of May the 1st, we then got the word that things were deteriorating. So we moved undercover in four rented vans to a position in the back streets of Kensington, out of sight of the terrorist stronghold. And then we made our way across and through back gardens until we could gain access without being seen to number 14. From there, we set up business got organized and this would be our home until the siege was busted on Monday, May the 5th. And it was from here that we did what we call target appreciation, going over everything in minute detail so that in your own mind, you could carry out the assault without any further orders once the balloon went up. The first team to arrive there generally set up what they call the immediate action commonly known it, um, throughout the regiment as the IA. What happens is the team arrives and they get the sketchy information that was available initially. That information is updated with all the latest information on site where you tend to get a little bit more information. And then from there, they work out a plan which is due to be ready and operational within about 30 minutes of actually arriving on site. So you arrive there, pick up the information, um, do your recce, reconnaissance on, you know, whatever the target was, in this case, Princess Gate. They go and do the reconnaissance. The team commanders then come back, get their men together, brief the team on how they see it going, tell each man what he's going to do as, uh, on a formal briefing, and that is the first plan that is ever put together. Because we were in such a nice holding area, really, as, as far as holding areas we've been in before, you could actually get your hands on and use uh, throughout the duration uh, of the operation. There were things there, televisions, books, telephones, all sorts of stuff. Uh, snooker championships run at the time, World Snooker Championships run at the time. The actual overall feeling was one of the excitement, will it or won't it happen? Um, are we ever going to be used? You know, we've got the chance this time, but will we be allowed to do it? Not once in the six days did we have our black uniform off. Everything was on. That is, as I stand now, um, gas mask very close by, weapons, uh, body armor, everything um, would be on you, or certainly within arm's length at all times, sh should the um, IA be called upon, that you could react immediately to it. Everybody, um, on the immediate action at this time would have had uh, a bullet in the chamber in the MP5 and any other weapon, including the 9mm pistol. It'd be in the ch chamber, ready, loaded, sorry, loaded and made ready at all times. The only thing would you'd have the safety catch on. The first form of intelligence is to interview the hostages who have been released from the stronghold. The guy from the BBC he was released uh, on about day one or two with severe stomach problems. And we gained a lot of information from that guy on the setup inside number 16, the amount of terrorists in there, the amount of hostages. Then, of course, you've got the caretaker who knows the building intimately, who gave us all the information about the, the armor-plated windows, which we didn't know about. He told us that the skylight of number 16 was in poor condition and quite possibly it could be forced. So we got our heads together and came up with a, a plan. Approximately 11 o'clock that night, Saturday night, we uh, made our way up onto the roof of number 14. Picked our way across the roofs until we got to number 16, found the skylight and took a good look at it. The lead surrounding the window did look in poor shape and the actual wooden surround was rotten and looked in a very weak condition. I could see there was a, 
a dodgy looking lock on the hasp. So I pulled that off and the hasp came free and then we were able to totally open the skylight itself. I thought, this is it. I'm going to be the first man into the Iranian embassy. So I suspended myself, head and shoulders, down into the room and I had a good look round. So you could say I was the first man into the Iranian embassy. I took in all the details of the room we reported it back on the radio but then it was decided not to further take any action at the moment as negotiations were reaching a, a critical stage so we withdrew from the skylight with all the relevant information and that was written into the deliberate action as a guaranteed entry point Darkness has fallen on the end of a long day. The gunmen are still inside and they still have most of their hostages with them. Apparently, they're no nearer giving up, although every siege watcher and those who are, who are skilled in the business of carrying on these negotiations know that every hour that goes by is an hour nearer a conclusion of some kind or another. <laughs> Uh, no, we're not prepared to free any of the hostages, but if you want to see a dead body of any of the hostages, you may see them in a few minutes. Will you, will you say to uh, Sally that I, I did not report back that threat before because it will destroy our argument mm -hmm. and I wish to keep this threat at the moment yes. between ourselves because it will not help me to argue his case. Megan ke in tahdidi ke qablan hum ye dafa gofti ijaze bedid mege man I refuse to listen. Go fan. Please uh, don't do something which will cause us kill the hostages because we don't really wish to do so. In the last hour, dramatic developments at the siege of the Iranian embassy in London. A new list of demands was brought out from the embassy and read out by Deputy Assistant Commissioner Peter Nevens, the police spokesman. Right. The statement of the group holding the hostages. We swear to God and to the British people and government that no danger whatsoever would be inflicted on the British and non-Iranian hostages as well as the Iranian hostages if the British government and the British police don't kid the group and don't subject the life of the hostages and the group to any danger. And if things work to the contradictory direction, everyone in the building will be harmed. Paragraph two. The reason for us to come to Britain to carry out this operation is because of the pressure and oppression which is being practiced by the Iranian government in Arabistan and to convey our voice to the outside world through your country. Once again, we apologize to the people and the government for this inconvenience. Mr. Do you understand Mr. by this that they've totally changed their demands message? now? This is part of the request that they have made and we are complying with it. Are they totally insistent upon these now being carried out? That they have asked that this be transmitted as wide as possible and I am asking you to do that on our behalf. I can't answer any questions. 
London senior policemen seem confident that caution and patience will bring this, this matter to what they call a non-violent conclusion. The validity of their calculations, of course, depends on the nature of the men they're dealing with. How much those men appreciate that the influence the British government can have over the volatile government in Iran is strictly limited. How much they appreciate that it is the way in this country for policemen to act as policemen with comparatively little governmental interference. For their part, the police feel that as long as the gunmen are letting their deadlines pass and they're still talking, then there's a strong hope that their suicidal fervor will wane and things will come to a non-violent conclusion. The news seemed hopeful. We knew the situation was desperate. Pretty! Pretty! Deadlines, noises in the wall, false promises. The whole psychological game was weighing them down. There's been a new development in the Iranian embassy siege. It was made known to reporters by Assistant Commissioner of Police at Scotland Yard, Mr. Peter Nevens. What sounded like two or three shots were heard coming from the direction of the Iranian embassy. And the significance of those noises is being investigated. As soon as bodies started to be slabbed, being taken out on a stretcher, the feeling within the squadron and the, 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 the men that I was working with at the time changed fairly dramatically. There's no turning back after killing people on British soil. Um, there's no second chance. The, the fate was definitely sealed at that point. It's with the deepest regret that I have to inform you that uh, further three shots were fired and just about seven o'clock a dead body was pushed out of the front door and we have recovered that body and it's now been removed to the mortuary. We, as you know, have tried exceedingly hard to avoid this situation developing into this tragic uh, turn that it's taken now. And all we could hope is that uh, we are still trying to plead with them to be sensible to be humane and to release those hostages that are in there. And I can only hope that uh, the good Lord will still be with us in this very difficult time for everybody. Did the gunmen offer, did the gunmen ask for a new deadline? I'm not prepared to discuss it Can you tell us what nationality is? I don't know, I don't know. Was it Middle Eastern? I don't know. Diplomacy had failed. The police could do no more. We were out the door before the statement was finished. The terrorists, they were told by their manipulators that it would be a 48 hours operation, that no harm would come to them because the British had gone soft. They thought they went for a good day out. They just hadn't heard of the SAS. Terrorists wanted a bus to the airport and a plane out of the country. What they didn't know was that the only way they were going to get out was either prison or a box. Five minutes to kill the others. It's up to you to decide. Hello. Yes, hello, Salim. The terrorists constantly played with grenades. They had grenades in each pocket. You don't mess around with guys like that. You go in hard. You go in hard and kill them, or else they'll kill you. 
While the negotiators kept them talking, we moved into the final assault positions. If you're looking out of the window... After we check it, after we check it, yeah. then you will put it inside the door. Well, let, let, let's talk about that then. Opposite the front door, you're looking straight out over the park. We didn't know exactly where the hostages were, bearing in mind there were something like 56 rooms in the Iranian embassy. The team that I was with were tasked to go to the back door. The idea was to blow the door in with the explosive entry, follow that into the rooms, and clear all the rooms on the bottom floor. There was the front balcony that we've all seen on, on the new reels. To the rear, we had guys up sailing down to the second floor, and of course, we had the people coming through the skylight to cover the top two floors. So we had all floors covered by those uh, entry points. There is no suspicious movement, does it? Okay. Owen, oh, the head uh, terrorist, was getting extremely agitated. And then, all of a sudden, he heard what he thought were suspicious noises. And I looked up and I could see the abseilers now coming down. I could see one of the, the abseilers becoming tangled because of the sheer amount of equipment he was carrying. I thought, Christ, it's going to go wrong, it's going wrong. And then we had a charge laid out to blow the French window door in. We couldn't blow the charge because the upblast would have caught the guy that was swinging in the abseil ropes. All I heard in the earpieces was, go, go, go. society at that moment in time. We had created our own society within number 16. <laughs> the law of the jungle, kill or be killed. And for that moment in time, we were could have been on a different planet. It wouldn't matter who was in there, what weapons they had, they couldn't stop us. They're not going to go in there to take prisoners. Somebody in there by weapon, he's been already been killing somebody. You don't go, go in there and say, hands up, I'm the police or I'm the some sort of force or other. You're going to go in there, you see them, you're going to shoot them. And you're going to shoot them, you're going to kill them. Yeah. Remember, a wounded animal is always more dangerous than a dead one. There was a terrorist that actually ran behind us. And where he came from, to this day, I'll never know. But he actually ran behind us, and uh, Derek had let off some rounds at him. So, we thought, right, we've got to go in the room, confirm where he is, because we didn't know if he was dead, alive, or whatever at the stage. So you're going in there, so we thought, well, we'll throw a flashbang in anyway. At least that gives a bit of light when we go in, you know, and it'll cover us at the door. I mean, if he's still alive, he's going to have his weapon pointing at that door. Yeah, that's his lifeline as such. But no sign of El Badi. And then Mal's shouting, 
uh, not but it was in Arabic. Basically, he was shouting, we're the police, we're the police. And what they are trying to do was to get the Arab, if he was alive, to shout back, basically to identify his position so we could sort of finish him off. And they thought, right, we'll just leave him for a minute. We'll get another couple of guys that's got torches. But the rough idea of where the guy must be hiding in the room, and as it was, come in there, torches on, this bloke, he's lying on a chase lounge and such, yeah, and it's sort of sprawled there like, you know, you see in old fashioned films, and that was it basically. As soon as the old light hit him, it was. You know, I mean, um, I don't know how many rounds each person sort of fired, but at least it put him on his ass, and that was him at the game. He was just left. I mean, he actually got roasted, you know. Um, you could smell it, you could smell old flesh burning. Having entered the room opposite the telex room, Tommy chased a terrorist from that room into the telex room. Prior to that, the other terrorist in that room had actually shot and killed one of the hostages and wounded a couple more of the hostages. He jumped into the hostages to hide. The trouble was he still had a pistol with him and he still had an hand grenade. hostages, where's the terrorist, where's the terrorist? They pointed to the terrorist because it is believed now they didn't like that particular terrorist. Tom's words were, search him, search him. On kicking his legs apart, a nine millimeter pistol was seen between his legs. The terrorist turned around with a grenade in his hand, about to pull the pin when he was shot by one of our blokes. Once the cellar was cleared, our next rallying point was into the foyer. So we came along the corridor of the cellar, up the stairs, and into the foyer. In the foyer, there was confusion, there was smoke. I could hear screams, I could hear gunfire. I could see a line of guys falling up on the stairs, and the word came down that they were going to pass the hostages out. Within seconds, the first hostages started to appear, and they began to be passed down the stairs hand to hand, don't forget there's gas swirling around. They don't have gas masks on, we have. They're hysterical, they're frightened, so they have to be physically manhandled from man to man. He came down the stairs, he got to the position where I was. I personally saw a grenade. I opened fire on him and um, shot him. It didn't affect anybody else. We just had one dead terrorist man at the bottom of the stairs. I'll never forget him. He was coming down in a, a crouched position. His head was down. He knew he didn't have long to live, and then I saw it. In his hand, he had a Russian assault grenade. I thought, I've got to do something, got to do something. Can't open fire, got to neutralise the threat. I brought the MP5 up, and I blighted the guy on the back of the neck. And just as I brought the butt down, his face turned towards me, and he had the look of death about him. He knew he didn't have long to live. He then rolled down into the foyer, Two to three magazines were then emptied into him and the sound was deafening and he twitched and vomited his life away on the carpet.
but as he did so, the hand holding the grenade flopped out, and there before us rose this grenade, and we all stopped dead just staring at the grenade, crystal clear, zoomed in on the pin. Was it in? Is the pin in? Is it going to go off? And in fact, the pin was in. This guy was so unprofessional that he'd left the pin in. No problem. The actual number of rounds, that was actually confirmed later on when they did the autopsy. I think they got to 78 or something, uh, which is not bad when you consider it. Two seconds, two point something seconds, and there's roughly about 80 rounds in this guy, and he just drops like a sack of spuds. The rest of the hostages are getting passed down the stairs. We were not to know that any of these women, or the other hostages as such, were terrorists. They could have been. So they're passed down the line of the blocks that are all there. They're passed outside into the, the guys at the back, the sort of reception committee, and as soon as they're handed over there, basically they were handcuffed, and they're all laid out in the grass. You know, the handcuffs, it's all plastic cuffs, nice and quick. So, I mean, you take them out there, and until you've got somebody there that actually can go up there and say, right, that is Mrs. Mohammed, she's the secretary, she's got nothing to do with them, then they can have the handcuffs removed, and they can be taken away, given a cup of tea and the old medical treatment, whatever they need. Out of the six terrorists that were in the building, five were killed in the building, and one effected his escape and is now still serving in prison, so we believe. We also believe that he was possibly helped out of that building by the hostages who did actually like that terrorist. They didn't like the one that was killed in the telex room, but we do believe that they did actually like the other one and he was helped out of that building. And so, once we knew all the, the hostages had left the building, that the rooms were clear, the flames were grabbing hold, we could see the smoke coming down the stairs, and we realised we had to get out quickly now, back into normal society, back into South Kensington. And so the order came over, the Iranian embassy is clear, abandon the building, abandon the building. As we were going out, somebody actually snatched the... Uh, insurance certificate off the foyer wall. It was in a glass case because he'd noticed that it actually ran out on uh, April the 30th. And that is why the Iranian embassy was never refurbished for a good 10 years. And it was left in its original siege condition, charred and burnt, and in fact became a tourist attraction. Coach loads of Japanese tourists would be taken past it and the tour operator would say, and on the left is the famous Iranian embassy where the SES busted the siege in 1980. While we were actually packing the kit away, um, old uh, Whitelaw turned up to say thank you to the blokes. Um, he was actually crying. But then again, I suppose if your job was on the line, you know, if we didn't have done others, he'd been sacked, I think. <laughs> no great loss. Anything that costs anybody's life, I don't regard as a good conclusion. We would have liked a peaceful resolution to this whole affair. Unfortunately, they took this extreme action that you saw, and the commissioner had no option but to consult rapidly with the Home Secretary and deploy the SAS. That's all I'm prepared to say. I think it highlighted to the... Uh, the world that when push comes to shove, the old gloves come off as far as um, the Brits are concerned. And we prove to the world if you go in hard against terrorists, they'll fall like a pack of cards. If you go for the ringleaders, take the ringleaders out, the rest will fall like a pack of cards. Appeasement just doesn't work. Negotiating with terrorists just does not work. You've got to go in hard, you've got to hit them hard, and teach them a lesson that they won't forget. In other words, you've got to put a bit of stick about. I think it acted as a warning to the, the terrorist world that if you bring your tactics to UK, you're going to end up on the slab. <laughs>